Stillwaters International Ministries presents For His Glory with Bruce and Rushma Allen. Hallelujah. We bless your holy name, Father. And there's so many people today. Thank you, honey, Reshma. There are so many people today fascinated by the supernatural, desiring to walk in the supernatural or an encounter with the supernatural. And the reason for that is because we were created for the supernatural. And for generations, the church never modeled or understood that fact. But in this hour and in this generation, in this season of time and history, God has reawakened a passion, a hunger, and a desire in his people for the reality of who he is. They've become tired and jaded to just hearing rhetoric. A gospel void of power, but full of pride. And so what is happening now is God is beginning to invade earth in a new way. I've, you know, I've just got to say this, and I'm going to reiterate this again and again wherever we travel because... The, the gross misunderstanding. You don't seek visitation of angels. Did you hear that? Yes. They're servants just like you are. It's the same thing, you know, I appreciate people when they come up and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, we're just vessels that God flows through. Thank Him. I understand the heart behind that, I do. But it, it, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Because apart from him, we can't do anything. I, I'm still humbled and I'm astounded that people even like the books I wrote. I, I'm just telling you the truth from my heart. I, I was so dissatisfed. I was, somebody called up and said, oh, this book is in a... What book are you talking about? Well, you know, the third... No, no. You, you, I, I know God touched it. God breathed into it. God blinded somebody's eyes or something, but... Do you understand, if we're just yield to God, he can use any of us. Even people from Menard, Texas. Amen! <laughs> and so, I, you know, let's just get, we don't seek visitation. But we can seek habitation of God. And we had a little bit of a round table, well, it wasn't a round table, it was a long table, with no table. But well, we answered some questions yesterday, and you know, I, I, the questions again reflect the same thing. Tell us about the supernatural. How many of you have ever seen an angel? So, you know, it's funny, everywhere we travel, people say, what do angels look like? You want to know? They look just like angels. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're appearing to non-saved, the unredeemed also. There was a, last year on our trip, there was a taxi driver, a Muslim taxi driver in Indonesia, outside of Jakarta, up in the mountains, there is a charismatic prayer center. And people from all over the country go there, they spend their vacations there, they just go up to pray, fast and pray. <laughs> I don't know if I want that kind of vacation, but anyway, that's what the children, adults, so this taxi driver had never been on this particular run. He, he dropped them off, and he just he thought it was absolutely beautiful. And so he took a digital picture. And he almost died of astonishment. Go ahead. That was not in perpetuity, by the way, that ordination. <laughs> you see, why does God do something like that? 
so we can go, ooh, ah, wow. No. Because the Lord is speaking as loudly and as clearly as he ever has, not only through his word, through visitation, through signs, wonders, and miracles, that you are a unique generation. It's the culmination. It's the fulfillment. It's the conclusion. It's the time we've all been dreaming of, hoping for, looking forward to. It's the, it's the hour that God birthed in that seed in your heart of, of, of passion to know Him face to face, to walk in the supernatural. This belongs to all of us. It belongs to all of us. We don't seek that, but we understand that. We seek Jesus. You know, I, again, well, let's turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is interesting in many ways, but <clears throat> Matthew 28. See, they disappear as fast as they appear. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm just going to say this one more time. Most of you know this by now. Second Peter 3.8 says, A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So from the time of Jesus until the turn of the century, we have completed two days, 2,000 years. Now we are early in the morning on the third day. And it's just, it's burning in my heart. Things are accelerating so quickly. Yes, they are. You know, we were just sharing today, by this time next year, the world's going to be an absolutely different place. Politically, geographically, socially, economically, spiritually. Right. It's going to be a different world. And I'm not talking minuscule change. I'm talking drastic changes about to come. And this is the hour you were created for. Right. Right. This is it. Matthew 28 one says, Now after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, it says, Very early in the morning, Mary Magdalene and the other women came to the garden tomb. The scripture actually lends itself to this fact that it was as they were going to the garden tomb very early in the morning on the third day, there was an earthquake. Man, there's much in that. That speaks to me on many levels, but let me, let me put it this way. You are the body of Christ. This generation is going to know what it means to enter into God's rest because it's the seventh day from Adam. It speaks of rest. Ken had a powerful message last night about Shiloh, peace. Yes. Yes, he did. Let me tell you something. The rest that God expects from us, the way we enter into that place is to embrace the death, the burial, and the resurrection that is part of our inheritance as the body of Christ. You are dead, and your life is hid in Christ Jesus. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, early in the morning of the third day, were headed towards that tomb, that grave. And the earth began to shake. And so many Christians today, because of the passion that's been birthed in our hearts for more of God, for the reality of God, are willing to pay the price of a crucified life. Many, everywhere we go, are embracing the revelation of what it truly means to live the crucified life. 
I am dead. It's no longer I who live. Therefore, I have no rights. I can't get offended. Wait a minute. That sounds good in preaching, but how do I live that? Die. Crucify the flesh. Oh, offenses will come. Look. You know, somebody can aff send offense your way. It's not an offense till you receive it as such. You're receiving the wrong thing. When offense comes, when there's an opportunity to have that, oh my goodness, start rejoicing. Because all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What do we look at? The offense, we don't look at the promise. Oh, God's telling me I'm doing something right. I remember one time when we, I was pastoring with my dad in Linwood, Washington, you know, God always sneaks up on me with these questions, and I, I'm not so glib to answer anymore. I just kind of, well, you know, Lord. But he said, how's everything going? I said, well, you know, God is pretty good, having a good time. We're glad you started. I just, he said, have you been suffering persecution? I said, well, no, Father. Everything's going great. And he said, what's the matter? <laughs> and immediately I got the boom. And I went, oh. He said, okay, Father, where's this glaring gap in my understanding of how I'm missing? What, I, you, you see, some of the things that God uses signposts in our life that we're walking where we should are persecution. And we think it's always, everything's going well, perfect. Well, even when persecution comes, you can be at peace and rest. So that's not the measure. I went, oh. So early in the morning on the third day, they chose to go to the garden too. Why? They're looking for a Jesus, a human Jesus. Not a supernatural Jesus, but a human Jesus. Why? Because he's dead. Three and a half years they had walked with this man who had given them revelation after revelation after revelation, poured everything he had into their lives, and yet for all of that they were still blind. Oh, I, I used to, there was a period of two years at the church there that, two and a half, three years maybe even, every message that God gave me to minister was on relationship. But after about six months into that, I said, God, can I please teach on something else? Everything's about relationship. And that's the foundation. But you know what he said? No, faith comes by hearing. And hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. Finally, after three years, they got it. I said, okay, Father, either I'm not communicating, or they got spiritual earwax a mile deep. <laughs> but do you understand? They spent three and a half years eating, sleeping, walking. I'm doing everything with Jesus. And they still didn't recognize him as Messiah. We're in good company. They're going back to the garden tomb to honor Jesus to prepare his body properly for burial, not realizing or understanding the fulfillment of everything God had prophetically spoken by his prophets about Messiah was about to be revealed to them supernaturally and sovereignly. First the natural, an earthquake. You've been hearing about earthquakes? Especially in the last hundred years? Let me make that even smaller. In the last... 10 years. In the last 10 years, we've had more in the last 100 years. Well, that's because they can record them. They're more sophisticated. No, it's because the birth pangs, pangs are closer and closer together. The earth is about to give birth. Amen. To what? Well, let me tell you something. The, the mature sons of God are coming forth. Daughters, sons, bride. 
It's never been a day like this. And so they're going. The first thing we hear is earthquakes. I want you to see these signs that speak to this generation. There was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Hmm. Let me get that straight. Because an angel of the Lord descended, there was an earthquake. And in the last 10 years, we've had more earthquakes than at any other time in history. Why? Do you know in the Tanakh, in the book of Enoch, that the Hebrews had an understanding that they were only one aspect of, of, of uh, the army of God. They always sent the siege engines before the army. You know what they called them? Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, I forgot that, Uriel. Uriel, Uriel. And so what did we see? We saw the angels of God going before the, the supernatural army of God going before the natural army of God because they were co-laborers at that time. They were fighting this battle together. They had their part to play. They were servants of God. In the same way in this generation, there's a lot of earthquakes. There's a lot of angelic activity. There's a lot of reclaiming what the devil stole. October 19th, last year in a visitation I had with Jesus he placed a helmet on my head I said this before but as a soldier past, having been a soldier I know the last piece of equipment you put on before you enter conflict is your helmet he put the helmet on my head and like every good soldier I said we're not ready he said I've already placed within you my people everything you need to walk in victory. And then he said, now go and enforce the victory. He didn't say win the victory, he said enforce it. He already won the victory. We're taken back what the enemy has stolen. Amen or oh no? You guys warm? Welcome to Singapore. <laughs> This is easy. Boy, you should come over there. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Oh. The book of Daniel, I think it's chapter 10, verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Daniel, seal up this book, the word of this prophecy, until the time of the end. Because in the time of the end, men shall run to and fro. And knowledge shall increase. That's our picture. In the last hundred years, again, the, revolu the, the, the industrial revolution and then the scientific, the guys we love, the gizmos, the electronics, has increased exponentially. And to get around the world, I mean, from here to Singapore is, is about 12 and a half hours. It's a couple hours to L.A. and then down or out of Canada. It's what? A little bit more, but you see, you can get around the world in 22, 23 hours. And people, millions of people do this a year. And knowledge has increased. First the natural, then the spiritual. Men shall be running to and fro. Translation. Knowledge is increasing. The knowledge of God and the God kind of knowledge. It's the end of the age. The prophetic picture is this. The word of God was entombed and covered with a stone. But an angel descended with an earthquake. And he rolled away the stone, the hardness of heart. And the word himself came forth. Here we are. Here we are. 
There has never been such a release of revelation and insight into the mysteries of the kingdom of God as there is right now. Never has been. And let me tell you something, it's accelerating. It's, what, you know, what took somebody like Ken 100 years to learn, or me 200 years, is going to take about two months. God's doing a quick work. But I'm determined, you know, our, by the way, our ministry team is from Minnesota tonight. But I'm determined I'm not going to be left in the dust while they're going forward. I'm going with them. I mean it. I am not one to sit on my blessed assurance. I, I want to be in the thick of it. So what God is doing right now is all who are thirsty come to the water. You know, the Bible says that God will give you the desires of your heart, doesn't it? Oh, genie in a bottle. Okay, let me make a wish. Now, we've had that misnomer for far too long. God says he will place within you the desire of your heart. Why? Because that's where he's calling you. So many say, do I, can I have a ministry? What's in your heart? Like, this was addressed. What's in your heart? Maybe it's the call of God. Our sister was talking today about wanting to be caught up into the third heaven. Ten years now, just longing and desiring that. Well, guess who put it there? She has an appointment. She's already written in. <laughs> Hello. It says, verse 3, the angel's countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. I shared today with, with our new best friends that, you know, when I was ministering in Kuala Lumpur when Jesus physically came into the, the meeting, that prior to that I was in the hotel on the 13th floor. Good number. It is. Jesus was number 13. And... I mean, these clouds rolled in. I watched them, big, dark, black clouds, and stopped over top of the hotel, over the P.J. Hilton. They stopped right there. Now, you know, you get tropical storms there. That's... But it stopped, and lightning and thunder began to strike that hotel nonstop. You can't tell me lightning doesn't strike in the same place. I watched it for two hours. I pulled that chair up to the plate glass window, not the brightest light bulb in the pack, but, <laughs> but I said, God, what are you saying? There was no fear. I knew it was God. Amen. Lightning? Let me say that again. His countenance was like lightning. And then when it came almost time for the meeting, one of the elders was coming towards the hotel to pick me up. Now I could see that when it was clear. I could see the church is about two and a half miles away. Because I'm way up. When he was coming towards the hotel, that whole thing moved right over the church. Do you know, nobody was asking for this. But I was teaching on your birthright is to see and go and Jesus shows up. and I mean, it was fun. The pastor's wife... Actually, the pastor's mother had, had really wanted to be at that meeting because she really, this thing was burning in her that she wanted to learn how to see, and, but she had to go to the hospital. She, something happened with her heart. So she's lying in hospital the whole conference. And when, the first night I got there, the Lord said, have everybody turn and, pray, and put their hand towards the hospital. And Father, we release the desire of her heart. That night she was visited by two angels that came to the foot of her bed and talked with her and then left. 
It wasn't about visitation by angels, do you understand? She just wanted to have her eyes opened, her heart's desires to see Jesus. But that's what Jesus said. Why? That lightning was like their countenance. It spoke of God activating something. Have you ever been in a meeting where through the, the hall, flashes of lightning go? You're looking at me like I'm from Canada. <laughs> I am, and it's a lot nicer up there. It's cooler. <laughs> Look, this will absolutely terrify those who are unprepared. And you will be unprepared if you don't know the Word of God and the God of the Word. How do I know that? Let me tell you, the unredeemed, this could kill them. You ever hear of dying by fr of fright? Look, the pastor's wife, we took one, we were going about a week, we took one night off. They said, we need to take one night break. That night, she was sitting by, she has her little chair by her bed in her bedroom. She told me the story the next day where she reads her Bible and does her devotion. About midnight, she's there, and all of a sudden she sees movement out of the corner of Ryan. She stood, turned and looked, and here was a 12-foot angel just like that one. And he brought a message from God that radically transformed her life. Messenger. She wasn't seeking that. She was seeking Jesus. I'm giving you guys keys. Look, don't seek that. Seek him. And let him do whatever he wants. It says, verse 4, The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. See, these were the unredeemed. I like this. Come on, get this in your heart. This is the hour we're going to see the saints and the angelic marching in rank together to fulfill the purposes of God in the earth at the end of the age. We are both servants. We're sons and servants, but they're servants. They're here to minister to you and for you at his behest. It shouldn't surprise us when we see that. We're going to start seeing it more and more frequently, even this year. Even this year. And again, how are you going to see it? Sometimes in retrospect, sometimes because you have been pressing into God and you're spiritually perceptive and you can discern, sometimes sovereignly, but all the time by faith. And it's going to be because you're pursuing Jesus. I want to tell you something. If you're pursuing anything other than Jesus, you're going to be deceived. Join us on our webpage for upcoming events and resources at www.stillwatersinternationalministries.com.